I assume you're talking about osteoarthritis here, which is generally what we call the wear and tear arthritis. And you can't reverse it, but you can make it feel a hell of a lot better. So the reason for this is that, let's go back a step. We've got lots of studies that show that when people lose weight, their pain significantly improves. The joint that we usually refer to when they talk about this in the research is knee, osteo knee arthritis. And it's been said that a 10% body weight reduction can reduce the pain of knee arthritis by about 50%. So most of the data would actually suggest it's probably only about 30%, but that's still pretty significant. And if it was only due to the weight loss, then we'd expect it to be proportional. We'd expect a 10% reduction in body weight to lead to a 10% reduction in pain, not a 30% or a 50%. So why is it? So it's very well accepted now that it comes down to a cytokine effect, that circulating molecules within our blood message your molecules. And I can tell you what those molecules are. So if you actually think about it, you get a soup bone, like the one you're going to make a big soup out of or you're going to give to a dog or something like that. And you know how you've got this shininess on the end of it. Um, it's, it's shiny, whereas the shaft of the bone is actually a little bit dull. So that shininess on the end is actually called articular cartilage. That's super smooth, super hard wearing. In actual fact, two sheets of articular cartilage rubbing against each other have less friction than wet ice. It, it's really smooth stuff. And apparently, I, I don't know how true this is, if you shoot a puck on ice, if you could shoot that same puck on human articular cartilage, it would go six times farther. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it's certainly a nice statistic to roll out from time to time. But basically, this is impressive stuff. Now, if you were to slowly grind this articular cartilage down, that's arthritis. And when we talk about grade one, two, three, or four, we're really just talking about, is it the first 25%? Are you in the next 50%, 75%, or how far through it are you? That's how we grade it. Now, you cannot, once you've worn away some cartilage, you can't replace it, but you can make it more resilient, what is left behind, because it doesn't actually have any nerves. So the fact that you've ground a bit away doesn't cause pain. But if it loses its function and doesn't absorb shock and protect the bone that's underneath, that bone has a lot of nerve and that can cause a lot of pain. So if we actually were to look at this articular cartilage under a microscope, you, what you would see is you would see a cell in the middle and that cell is called a chondrocyte and that would be surrounded by a protein scaffolding that we call the extracellular matrix. And that extracellular matrix is what actually makes the cartilage resilient and strong. And there's some things that can make the, the chondrocyte in the middle is making this extracellular matrix or this scaffolding all the time. And there's other forces in the body which are breaking it down. And if the force is breaking it down uh, much, much, you know, quite high, then that means you can only secrete a very little and not a very stable extracellular matrix. So the resiliency of the cartilage and the ability to protect the underlying bone is going to be much reduced. So then the question is, what factors actually lead to breaking down of this scaffolding? And the only protein in our body that can break down that type of collagen is called a matrix metalloproteinase. Matrix metalloproteinase, it sounds awful, but basically metallo just means it's got a metal line in there. Proteinase means it can break down protein and matrix just refers to it breaks down the extracellular matrix. So it's actually, you know, a, an almost logical name. And they're made by the liver. Now, the liver normally makes a, a small amount in the background. It's what we call a constitutive secretion. It's always making a little bit. But if you have fatty liver disease, you make a whole lot more. And some of that extra stuff that gets made circulates around the rest of the body and it gets exposed to your cartilages to this extracellular matrix so it weakens it so it weakens all the proteins and all the collagen proteins in the body 
And so that means that you're more likely to develop tendon injuries, which are also made of collagen. You're more likely to have arthritis pain because you, the lining of your joints is less resilient. So when you lose a little bit of weight, the beautiful thing is the weight that you lose first actually comes away from your liver. So even before you lose the pot belly, you're reversing fatty liver disease. You reverse fatty liver disease, reduce the amount of fat in the liver, the body makes less of these matrix metalloproteinases. We abbreviate them as MMPs. If you have less MMPs, then that means there's less of this breakdown stress on your articular cartilage. And even though you've got the same amount of cells, the same amount of chondrocytes, that hasn't changed. It means that the area around them, that scaffolding is much bigger and much stronger and much more resilient. And that protects the underlying bones. And what we actually find, so I work with an orthopedic surgeon called Dr. Duran Shur, he's an excellent surgeon. But what we find is that when he gets his patients to lose weight and go on a healthy ketogenic low diet, low in seed oils, low in carbohydrates, about 30 to 50% of the patients who would have been booked in for surgery cancel. They no longer need the surgery. Is the arthritis reversed? Well, technically it's not reversed, but their pain's gone away. And that's pretty much the same thing. So it's very important to not be confused between the difference between urea and uric acid. So eating a lot of protein absolutely will increase your urea. But that can absolutely be a good thing. Let me tell you about one of the major benefits of this. In no way do I consider an elevated urea to be problematic. Um, you'll urinate a lot of it out. There's a study done, I think it was in 1963, that actually showed that the most important factor in urine in terms of antibacterial activity was how much urea you had. And there's been several studies that have then looked at um, different diets, a, a, a few of them were in dogs where they were trying to actually induce urinary tract infections. And they found that they could give dogs who weren't eating much meat urinary tract infections, but when they fed them meat, they couldn't because the urea um, in their urine was uh, basically killing the bacteria before it could proliferate. So I would actually suggest that, especially for females, this is a particular female issue, if you're worried about uh, uh, UTIs and have a problem with urinary tract infections and a high protein diet, increasing your urea could certainly be a good thing. And for a little bit of extra bonus on top of that, I would supplement with a good mix of electrolytes, including sodium, potassium and magnesium, because we also know that the combination of salts or electrolytes in the urine also exerts extra antibacterial activity. And I've had several patients who previously suffered from chronic UTIs. It, some patients even have so many UTIs that they're on a daily antibiotic long term permanently um, to try and reduce the risk of developing UTIs. And I've had patients who have been able to come off this, you know, antibiotics every day is not a good long term solution. Much better to have a healthy diet, high protein diet with good electrolytes. Very natural way to do it and much more effective and no side effects. Um, uric acid is actually also often going up on a ketogenic diet, but that's something different. So uric acid um, is a breakdown product of purines. Um, in some people, it can cause attacks of gout because it can crystallize and form these needles. When we look at it under a microscope, it's what we call negatively birefringent crystals when we do something called polarized light microscopy. That's just a fancy way of saying sharp needles that we can diagnose. And they cause terrible, terrible pain in a lot of people. So a lot of doctors get very concerned when they see a high uric acid level. A lot of doctors make the mistake where they assume that if you have higher uric acid levels, you must have gout. And that's absolutely incorrect. And a lot of, uh, I wish people would stop making that mistake. It just increases the possibility. Having said that, uh, most, uh, most of the purines and most of the uric acid we get doesn't actually come from meat in the diet. It's a big myth that meat is actually what causes an increase in uric acid and increase in gout. Um, you will get a transient increase in uric acid when you start a ketogenic diet because your body will start producing ketones, but the cellular machinery for your body to actually burn those ketones 
hasn't been upregulated yet. So the body says, oh, I've got too many ketones. What do I do? Well, we're going to urinate them out. They pass out through the kidneys and they share the same transporter that uric acid does. So if the ketones are leaving the body, they're actually making it harder for uric acid to leave the body. So you'll often get an increase in uric acid level for about a month or so after starting a ketogenic diet. The thing is, this doesn't lead to a surplus of attacks of gout. I think I've only seen one patient who's had an attack of gout while they've been on this kind of diet. And I would say that the chances are that that probably would have happened anyway. That was almost certainly coincidental. I see a lot of people who have histories of gout and even though their uric acid level may go up during that transient period of a ketogenic diet, their chances of having an attack of gout are actually down. And it's actually my job to usually reduce the medications that people take to try and suppress their uh, uric acid levels. They usually take a drug called allopurinol, which is what we call a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, which a xanthine oxidase is the enzyme that processes purines into uric acid. And I'm very successful in, uh, in a lot of patients who have had a chronic history of gout. Once they're stable on a diet and they've lost a lot of weight and they're metabolically healthy, we say, well, let's stop the allopurinol and see what happens. 99% of the time, Almost, I can't even actually recall a case where I've stopped allopurinol and they, they've had to go back on it. Um, so uric acid related to protein is really not a valid concern. Urea related to protein might actually be beneficial. Thank you so much, Paul. So now we have questions from subscribers, Paul. First question is, will high protein diets damage my bones? That is an no. That's the easy answer, but let, let's go back into it. So how did this myth arise that protein is bad for the bones? Well, it, it came over 100 years ago when we actually discovered that when people had high protein diets, there was higher levels of calcium in the urine. And people assumed that that calcium must have been leached from the bones. In actual fact, that is not true because when you have a higher protein diet, you absorb more calcium from the diet. So, and if you absorb more calcium, then that means there's potential for more to then leave the body in urine, but it's not being lost from your bones. It's just being lost because you've just absorbed more. In actual fact, we have randomized control trial level of evidence that a high protein diet can assist in reversing osteoporosis. So there was this study done back in 2002, and they looked at supplementing with calcium and vitamin D. And they looked to see whether or not they could actually reverse osteoporosis. They followed people over three years and they did a bone density, a DEXA scan, dual energy x-ray, every six months over that three years. And this was menopausal females and males over the age of 65, I think it was. And what they found that on average, they could slow bone the bone degrading by giving vitamin D and calcium, but they couldn't restore it. And then they did something smart. They said, what happens if we stratify the results based on how much protein people are consuming? And they found that the group that was consuming the most protein actually reversed osteoporosis in their hip bones, reversed osteoporosis. And this is really logical because bone is mineralized protein. It's protein strands that's got minerals embedded within it. So if you're trying to build more bone, you can't just give calcium because that's not the complete ingredients. You need all the ingredients. Bone has protein in it. 40% of the dry weight of bone is protein. So a high protein diet has been shown to be conditionally essential to actually reverse osteoporosis. Protein is good for the bone, full stop. <laughs>